uh, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew 28, 16 through 20. We know this uh, verse really well, uh, but let's read it together one more time. Oh, this church takes training serious, huh? Wow, but anyways, that's good. <laughs> Hardcore. <laughs> Matthew 28, 16 through 20. <clears throat> we'll uh, read four verses together. Okay. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Let's read it together. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. I'm glad to be here. Uh, especially, I could be more free now because this is C4 training, but until yesterday it was headquarters training. And uh, actually it was C4 training because we only had, I think the majority of the members that attended were from this church. Okay, But anyhow, so uh, I'm going to use the board today. Uh, please uh, excuse me, my handwriting is not that great. Okay, uh, But you guys will get the idea, so it will be fine. Uh, but they all say, all throughout history, all the genius, people who are smart, the handwritings were bad, so it's giving you a uh, heads up, right? Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to really, uh, I was really touched through uh, today's worship uh, because I know Pastor Song really well. He speaks English, but it's broken English. It's like Jackie Chan English, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, he's talking about multi ethnic, all nations. I'm like, huh, like, you know, I'm just like, okay. But you know, just seeing here, uh, you know, Hispanic people and uh, just non-Korean Americans sitting here, I was like, wow! And you know, they're actually receiving grace. Just be watching all of you receiving grace. Uh, it was um, a really touching moment for me. Uh, but more than that, I'm really thankful for actually non-Koreans who are involved in Remnant Ministry uh, because. I mean, it's amazing. Like, I'll be honest with you, right? I, I grew up here in the United States. I came here when I was seven, okay? And I'm only a few years younger, okay, uh, than Pastor Song. I'm not going to give you my age, okay? Just a few years younger, right? So, uh, you know, I grew up here in America for the rest, like, uh, for, for all my life. Like, I was, uh, I grew up in Virginia, Washington area. And uh, me being involved in Remnant Movement wasn't even easy, okay? Even though I'm Korean-American. Because right, everything's so Koreanized. But when I look at all the non Koreans who are sitting here, it's a miracle. Right? It's a blessing. Uh, I mean, I asked myself if Pastor Yu was like Cambodian, then would I go to the conferences or would I move out to Cambodia? I, mean, I don't think we think about this. That's why I'm sharing. You know, if Pastor Yu was Vietnamese, I mean, think about this. Would you go sit there and say, you know, listen to all the messages, you know, receive training? I don't think so. It's hard, right? That's why the few of non-Koreans who are here is God's answer, right? God is wanting to do this. Uh, he, he wants to do this second RUTC movement in the year 2017. Through whom? Through you. Through C4. Amen? It doesn't matter, okay, if we don't have much. As long as we hold on to the covenant of Christ, God's going to accomplish it. We have to be a living witness of this. Not people who say, oh, you know, we had this amount of workers who helped us out. You know, we had this amount of uh, money, so we could have done this multi-ethnic ministry. We, God doesn't need that kind of person. God needs a person, people, church, who says, God used us for multi-ethnic evangelism. Because we're holding on to the covenant of Christ. We have to be those people. That's why today, I want to share our identity, like our importance of all nations ministry. I like, to use, I like to use the term all nations better because like uh, Josue, uh, assistant pastor, as he was sharing, that you know, we say we're Koreans, you're multi-ethnic. You know? It's so true. Right? We're all nations. Right? So I think we need to fix that kind of attitude first. Right? 
So what all nations missions. All nations missions, right? Through C4. Amen. I pray they will be your church. Like, you know, I don't get jealous. Okay? I'm I'm more of a type, you know, who's kind of individualistic, you know, you leave me alone, I leave you alone. You know? I, I don't care, right? And for me, like I don't care if you guys are used as the first church to start this all nations ministry throughout the whole United States. I pray that you guys will do it. Somebody has to do it. We've been doing this remnant movement for 20 years. How many all nations people do we have? Like, I don't know if it bothers you or not. We go to all nations conference throughout the United States. There's a poster. It says all nations conference. But there's only five people in the front sitting that are, all, you know, that are not Koreans. And rest of the people, I know the Koreans are all nations too. But rest of the people, same people that I've seen for 20 years. Okay? Why do I say this? When I went, went to Korea, I was shocked because when I went to the missions conference, they have different disciples from all nations, like people from Spain, like Jose, uh, you know, assistant pastor. There are people from like Cambodia, India, right? Some of the people who are trained with the gospel in Pakistan and in India, like one person I heard last year, he was martyred. They killed him because he believed in Jesus Christ. We're seeing all these people rising, except where? America. And I know what people say, America, Satan is so powerful, you know? I understand, but it's been 20 years. And that's why when Pastor you gave us a message this year, second RUTC movement, it's not coincidence, right? God wants to answer our prayers. He wants to answer this uh, second RUTC movement through whom? Through you. We have to hold on to this as our covenant. All nations ministry. Pastor Yu gave this message last year. He said, you are one in a 10 million. That's how important you are. Don't look at yourself through your circumstances. Don't look at yourself through your bank, banking account. I don't think anybody's rich here, right? <laughs> don't look at yourself through grades for students. A lot of us, we judge and our standard is based upon how much we have, or how successful am I, right? Do I live in a house or an apartment? We need to see ourselves with the eyes of God. When God sees you, who are you? We're a child of God. Right? We're remnant. We're main figures to do this all nations ministry. One in 10 million. When Pastor Yu gave that title, I was like so thankful. Think about it, we don't know the value of ourselves. Do you know how valuable you are before God? Not because you're important, you know, because you are all that, right? But because you have covenant of Jesus Christ. The covenant in you is that much important, right? We're valuable before God, but we always judge ourselves, oh, you know, I can't do it. You know, I want somebody else to do it. That's what I'm sick and tired of, you know, people saying, you know what, you know, more qualified, so you do it, you know? We all have to do it. That's why we are here in America. That's why we live in Los Angeles. I know we came here for different reasons. It's a lot of times money reason, right? Uh, this is land of you know, opportunities, right? But God has brought us here, even though our motives are wrong, for the purpose of world evangelism. It starts with you and I. When we realize our identity, one in 10 million. Matthew 28, as you know really well, 16 through 20. When Jesus gave this message to the disciples, it doesn't fit in with the circumstance. When Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, think about their situation. Many of these people are fishermen. They have never left Jerusalem. And Jesus promises them, saying, and commands them to go and make disciples of all nations. It doesn't match. Just like us today, we hear about world evangelism. We, heard, we hear about, you know, all nations ministry. When we match with our circumstance, it doesn't match. Just like that, we see during this time, it didn't match with the disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations. They're fishermen, never left Jerusalem. They weren't educated. Right? They were poor. Better yet, when they gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ, they're persecuted. But yet, they held on to God's promise. If God's word and your circumstance 
does not match, hold on to the covenant of Christ. That's how you transcend above your situation. That's how we transcend above, transcend above our spiritual problems. Hold on to the promise of Christ. So here, I want us to really think about this. If we think about this message and know who we are, first thing that has to be restored in our lives is what? Thanksgiving. Are you thankful because of Jesus Christ? Amen? Are you thankful that you're saved? Knowing that Jesus is the Christ is a miracle. I've been hearing this all my life, but things started to change when I started to go out to the field and evangelize uh, in the field and confirmed it for myself. Like, per personally, you know, I could share so many stories, but you know, there's so many Christians who are lost today. You know the book called Purpose Driven Life? Right? Rick Warren, I mean, he has a church here. He made $60 million writing that book. You want to be rich, write a book. Okay? <laughs> $60 million, right? Purpose Driven Life. And uh, if you ever get a chance to read the book, uh, the content isn't that great, right? It's actually disappointing, right? But when you look at the title of the book, Purpose Driven Life, I mean, okay, that makes sense. But why are so many Christians buying this, buying this book? Because why? They have no purpose in life. Many Christians today, right, they don't understand why Jesus has to be the Christ. Many Christians today, they don't have a purpose in their life. But you and I, as we sit here, even though we may be poor, even though we may be weak, we have Jesus Christ. We have God's purpose of world evangelism. We have to know who we are in Jesus. That's why our first answer, thanksgiving. Are you thankful? I am so thankful for Christ. Because for me, I grew up in church all my life. My father passed away when I was seven. I was sharing a little testimony of, um, a few days ago. But I just, we have new people here, so I just want to share a little bit. Uh, I came to America when I was seven. My father passed away. And, uh, you know, all my, you know, mom's side, they all lived in D.C. area, so that's where we moved. And uh, just, you know, grow growing up uh, during that time wasn't really easy because, you know, uh, my mom had to, you know, do two, you know, she had two jobs. And, uh, you know, my brother and I was seven. He's five, two years younger than me. And uh, we'll go to school uh, by ourselves. And I have to cook for my brother. Like, you know, but we swore, I have two boys, uh, nine and seven. And, uh, you know, I'm telling my wife, one month ago, we spoiled our kids, you know. When I was seven years old, I would cook my own ramen, you know, or, you know, cook and things like that. But, you know, my boys, they don't know how to do that, right? The world has changed. And that's when I realized, man, I'm getting old, you know, because that's what my mom and all the adults would tell me, you know, when I was your age, you know, here I am, I'm saying, you know, when I was their age, you know, I was cooking ramen, right? And uh, just... Doing that and, you know, coming home from school in the United States. I know a lot of Korean parents do this and a lot of, not actually, not just Koreans, but all nations. They break the law, right? Uh, they, they leave their children at home, right? So if you're guilty, repent, right? <laughs> and um, basically, you know, my mom, <coughs> she bought a thick, you know, curtain. So, this, you know, the, the light won't penetrate. So they won't see what's going on inside. So we come home. And we'll just close the curtain, right? We'll never go outside. And we're so scared, you know, we'll just turn on the television, right? To just have the background noise. But um, just growing up like that, I started questioning about life. You know, because all my friends who are seven years old during that time, they thought about G.I. Joe's, Transformers, toys, you know? But I had no choice. I had to think about life. And I was just thinking about life, you know, I said to myself, you know, there's something missing in my life. You know, life is not just about living, you know, making money and dying, right? Uh, and uh, I had th these kind of questions. And uh, when I was like in sixth grade, seventh grade, I went to a retreat. And uh, the preacher, now I look back, he didn't really preach about the gospel. He just said, while we were praying, there was a demon-possessed girl, right? So um, we're all scared. And the pastor is like, you don't want to be demon-possessed? You need to accept Jesus Christ. <laughs> and everybody's you know, raising their hands and... You know, they're all crying and receiving Jesus Christ. So, but anyhow, you know, still somewhat gospel was there, and, you know, I accepted Christ. And I said, you know what, this is it. This is what I'm going to do, right? 
Uh, I remember seventh grade, I gave my life to the Lord saying, Lord, I want to be a pastor when I grow up. And I want to be used, used by you. Right? That's the reason why I live. And uh, so I started to pray from uh, you know, that, that time on and get involved uh, with church. You know, I remember a uh, praise leader, he was senior in high school, but you know, he's pray, he, he, he was bad. So I went up to him, I said, you know what, I'm taking over. You know, you sit down, right? And uh, they didn't talk back to me because they knew my heart, right? Uh, and uh, I got really involved with church at young age. You know, I would fast like Fridays in senior year in high school, right? Because uh, why? I wanted to be a holy person. I wanted to be used by God, right? So I wouldn't watch like radio or movies, you know? And, uh, you know, I would really force myself to pray. I had a closet and I would use that as a prayer closet, you know? I would read my Bible. Not just reading my Bible, like, you know, one verse or one, one chapter a day. Because I'm going to be a man of God. I'm going to read my Bible as much as I can. So I used to read like 10 chapters a day. You know, I served the church and I cleaned the bathroom. I gave rides and I did all this Bible study. And, you know, even everyone, they said, if you want to be a Christian, just follow Brian. That's, that's what people used to say. But in my heart, I was so empty. The more, you know, I get into like church programs and, you know, become a leader, I feel so empty. And people are asking me, are you receiving any answers? Because they're not receiving any answers. But I'm a leader. So I can't, you know, discourage them. So I'm like, yeah, I get answers every day. You know? And I'm like, oh my gosh, what kind of can answer do I get? You know? And uh, that, not just answers. Also, you know, I was like, uh, I would give kids rides uh, at home. And uh, I'm driving home by myself. And I'll feel empty in, inside. And I'm like, is God really alive? And uh, basically, I was so, uh, you know, heartbroken. And I was so empty inside. I went to see uh, my pastor then, and I asked him, uh, Pastor, you know, I feel so empty. Um, I don't know what's going on. And the pastor looked at me, and uh, he, you know, had this serious look. And I was like, okay, he's going to give me the answer. From now on, <laughs> no more pain, no more suffering, right? I'm going to really enjoy Jesus. And he said two things. Number one, you're not praying enough. So I'm like, not praying enough, you know? And second, you're not reading the Bible enough. Like, when I heard that, I was just shocked. I mean, what do you mean I'm not praying enough and, you know, reading the Bible enough? What do you have to do? What does God want me to do? Read the Bible 24-7, you know? Or pray 24-7? There's, like, uh, there's a place called monastery if you want to, you know, go there and, you know, do that, right? 24-7. And, you know, that wasn't the answer. I remember during that time, too, I had a close friend. Uh, you know, he, he had a broken family. His life was rough. And uh, we were in college. And, you know, one night he was in the corner. And uh, he was, you know, he's drunk. He's crying in the corner. So and I went up to him to help him. I said, hey, what's going on? He said, you know, my life is so messed up. I want to kill myself. And, uh, you know, I started, you know, patting his back. And the words that came out of my mouth just... You know, I had shame just saying this. I said, you know what? That's why you need to go to church. And he got really upset. And he flipped the table. Don't you think I want to go to church, but I can't go to church like this. I'm so dirty, right? I don't deserve to go to church. When he started getting upset like that, I was so embarrassed. Only thing that I could say to a person who's struggling, go to church, you know? So with this in mind, you know, I started questioning about faith, and I fell into depression. I said, God, if you really wanted, wanted me, want, to me, want me to become a pastor, right? Um, you need to give me an answer. Because see, I can't give the answer to the people, right? I see Jesus that is in Paul in the Bible. Paul says he's content. The same Jesus is inside of me, but I don't have contentment. So my question is then, is Jesus and Paul greater than the Jesus that is inside of me? No. Right? Same Jesus. So I cried out to the Lord, God, if you love me, right, I need you. You need to answer me. You need to give me an answer so I could give the answer to the people who are hurting. During that time, I prayed for about a, a year, and I uh, met this pastor. And for the first time, I heard this message, Matthew 16, 13 through 20. You are the Christ, the Son of living God. When I heard that, I was so shocked. Because I grew up in church, but I've never heard that message before. You know? 
But it's not just the message. There was my life answers. You know, I realized when the pastor was going over the six non-believer state, I realized, hey, that's my state. That's my family. And I realized that how can we get out of this problem? There's no other way. God's perfect method, Jesus Christ. I confess that Jesus is the Christ, and once again, I received him into my heart. And for three days, I couldn't go to sleep. Because I was so shocked. I realized, wow, Jesus is the Christ. He solved all of my problems. He's with me. Like, I'll, I'll sleep in the middle of the night, you know, I'll get up, you know, smiling and rejoicing. Wow, it is finished. All of my problems has been finished. And ever since then, that's how I got involved with this remnant movement. And uh, for many years, I had the opportunity to go out to Korea during 97, 98. If some of you guys went during that time, I don't, I don't recognize any faces, right? Uh, it was pretty bad. I don't, I don't need to tell. I could speak about the experience for like three hours. <laughs> I don't want to waste time like that, right? Uh, but going through all these things and listening to the messages, yes, it changed my life. But there's a second turning point. Uh, in my, uh, I guess, uh, journey as a remnant. And that was when I started going out to the college campuses and sharing the gospel to people. You know, the words that we've been hearing, Jesus is the Christ, the non-believer state, right? All these things, right, were real to me when I went to college campuses and started sharing the gospel to the people. You know, when I first went out, you know, with all these Korean pastors like Pastor Peter, you know, they're like, let's go praise, and you know, we're going to share the gospel to people. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. And I still remember Penn State, there's about 20 people. And all these 20 people, they're not you know, remnants. They're older remnants, like past beyond like 40s, right? And uh, there they are, you know, they're singing. You know, they're singing like, they don't have smooth groove when they sing, right? So they're either stiff, right? Or they're just, you know, using their right arm and singing like this. And, you know, I feel like I was in like, you know, North Korea or something, you know. <laughs> so I'm singing and leading praise because they asked me to lead praise. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, this, this is so bad. I'm like praying, God, please send someone. Please send a police officer or security, right? Because I can't do this anymore, you know. And uh, no one came. So we kept on praising, and for the first time, I experienced power of praise in the field, like for one hour, right? All the force of darkness being broken in me, within our group. And as we went out to share, evangelize, I was shocked. Here I am saying, you know, all these people, they can't speak English, nothing's going to happen. But when they go out, they get acceptances, but I don't get any acceptances. Like this one particular pastor from New York, he says this all the time, his English only angels and Satan can understand. Like, no one understands, right? And, like, I'm, like, just standing next to him, and he's, like, saying, like, Jija, 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 right? It's Jesus. He couldn't pronounce Jesus. It's like, Jija, Jija, right? Jija, your heart, you know? And, um, and this guy, like, he's, like, crying and receiving Jesus Christ. And I'm, like, wait a minute, what's going on here? This is not right, right? And like another part, I'm hearing like side, 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 like rice in Korean. I'm like, what? I go over and I listen, it's like salvation. So they can't say it's like salvation. So side, side, side. I'm like, what? And then you see people accepting Christ. But here I speak English, I share the gospel, and no one accepts Jesus Christ. I'm like, there's something wrong here. And I began to really think about this. And um, I still remember the first time when I uh, went out to the field and shared this gospel, I went over uh, the gospel track. And our elder was uh, attached to me, and uh, we had to go talk to a person. And, you know, I don't want to, I got to save my face. I'm a pastor. He's an elder. So, you know, I got to share this gospel, but I've never shared it before, one-on-one. -on -one. So I started reading uh, the gospel track. You know, man was created to be in the image of God, to be with him and him alone. And, you know, Genesis chapter 3, I started reading it. But when I was reading it, I, I was reading it with sure assurance that this person is not going to accept Jesus Christ. I was like, oh, he's not going to accept. I, you know what? I got to read it. So I started reading it. I was like, so do you want to accept Jesus Christ? He's like, yes. I was like, what? Because <laughs> like, I was shocked. He's like, yes. And then he did accept Jesus Christ. And he told me, you know what? All my life, I'm starting to be a teacher, but I want to go teach in third world countries and really help those poor people. 
But now you have given me an answer. Not just teaching them, but I could go there and give them life. This guy was just a church goer. He, didn't, he never accepted Christ. And when I experienced that, I realized, wow, God is real. Jesus is really the Christ. Seeing souls change. Like you know, another soul that I still remember, Penn State, he was standing uh, in the corner of the room, and I went, walked up to him. I said, hey, my name is Pastor Brian. I really want to share this message. He's like looking at his clock. He's like watch, and he's like, uh, about 10 minutes. Go ahead, you know. So I'm uh, sharing the gospel, you know, he's actually smoking, you know, he's like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with this guy, right? And uh, but I was sharing, slowly he, you know, uh, starts listening carefully. And basically he goes, he goes Pastor, uh, I have problems in my life. I was like, what do you mean? What kind of problems do you have? And uh, he's like, you know, I'm a junior in college, but I have nightmares every night. I hear voices. And so I told my parents and my friends, and uh, they're like, you're crazy, you know? Uh, and, you know, he wets his bed every time he sleeps. So he has this problem. And, and I told him, this is a spiritual problem, right? That's why we need to receive Christ, right? That God will take care of you. Right? You could become his child. You could fight in Christ's name. And uh, he said, okay. So he wanted to accept Jesus. So we were about to pray. The next thing you know, a girlfriend walks in. And uh, the girlfriend's like, hey, you know, let's go. And, and I was like, great, he's not going to accept Jesus Christ. But surprisingly, he said, hey, hold on. I have to pray with this pastor right now. So I was like, okay. So we held hands, and he accepted Jesus Christ. But not just receiving Jesus Christ, you know, I connected him to uh, the upper room ministry there. But I remember giving him my information and praying for him, and as I was walking, away from him, I just wanted to say bye one more time. And when I looked at him, he was crying. And he said, Pastor, thank you for saving my life. And when I heard that, you know, I, I almost cried too. But I was so thankful. I realized, wow, this is life of Jesus Christ. All the messages that I've been hearing that Jesus is the Christ, Genesis chapter 3 problem, right? Christ our prophet, priest, and king. All these things that I've been hearing, now I was confirming it in the field. What well, this is the message that everyone needs. So there are two turning points in my life. But also there's another third one. I don't know if you guys know, I don't want to go into details. But the pastors that I was really close to doing college ministry, uh, they're no longer with the remnant ministry. And uh, during that time, uh, we had a fallout. And uh, for me, I just had a lot of difficult time and uh, just didn't want to see anybody. So for about two years, uh, I was, uh, I guess, uh, what, what do you say in English? Chamzu? <laughs> missing in action. Yes, I was missing in action. No one could find me, right? And, um, you know, for two years, uh, I was missing in action. Uh, number one was um, the first year I was like, uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm not it. You know, I'm not a remnant. And, you know, I was like really discouraged. Like, you know, at night, I would have nightmares every night. Pastors appearing in front of me and saying, you know, you're, God's not going to use you anymore. You're done. And, you know, actually, you know, I know we laugh at it right now, but it was a serious problem for me. So for one year, like, I'm like, oh, my gosh, what do I do? And uh, <coughs> second year, I said, you know what? We need to take this gospel, right? Not just to the people within the remnant, but we need to find other hidden remnants outside of remnant movement. And if we could save, especially the Christians, like all other Christians out there, they're Christians. We can't say they're not Christians, they're Christians. But they don't know the value, they don't know the accurate gospel. So I said to myself, you know what? Let's save those people too. So I had an opportunity to go to a retreat, a non-remnant church, about 300 youth group kids, and there, I shared the gospel. And of course, a lot of people didn't understand as I was giving the basic message. But there were 30 students who raised their hands and accepted Jesus Christ. When I saw that, I realized, yes, there are other remnants out there. And uh, just seeing that, you know, I realized, what am I doing right now? I can't be discouraged right now. I need to hold on to the covenant and really challenge myself. And I had the opportunity to join a Korean-American church uh, the pastor knew I was involved in the remnant movement, but he said, it's okay. You know, don't worry about it. You could do whatever you want to do, but you just take care of the English ministry, and I'll take care of the Korean ministry. So I got involved with the English ministry there, 
And uh, as I was uh, doing ministry, what I did was I went through the basic messages that we know, non-believer state, 12 uh, meanings of acceptance, you know, talked about, you know, five assurances continuously. And about 12 people gathered, like the 12 disciples, but anyways, 12 people gathered. And, um, you know, we started going out, evangelizing, holding on to the message. And these are non-remnant people. And uh, when we did this first training, within uh, two weeks, about 56 people accepted Jesus Christ. And these people, I mean, they, they were sharing, you know, gospel better than the remnants, right? Accurate gospel. Jesus is the Christ, right? So we're all shocked. I realized, wow, this is it. And uh, during that time, we needed a youth pastor, so we had to hire a youth pastor, and he joined uh, with me to go out and do evangelism camp. And, um, you know, he confessed this to me later, saying, um, Pastor Brian, my grandfather's a pastor. My dad's a pastor. But, you know, I really didn't know what ministry was about. Actually, I thought ministry was about just babysitting. Make people happy in church, then we'll grow, right? Like Pastor Song said, right, you could be the remaining, but right, don't be scattered, right? <laughs> Meaning leaving the church, right? And um, just seeing that, uh, he said, Pastor Brian, but after going out with you and hearing this message, I found answers, right? I know now why I have to be a pastor. And, uh, you know, he'll be coming on Monday. He works with me right now. But uh, just hearing that, you know, was amazing. Just he, we went out to evangelize for the first time, and this guy also he had never evangelized before. So you know, I you know pushed them. There was a uh, Hispanic guy uh, standing on the corner, so I asked him to go and share the gospel. So he goes there, and uh, he's like very uh, nice guy. So he's not really up on your face. So he's like, "Hi, excuse me, you have time?" And the guy's like, oh, "I gotta eat. I'm hungry, right?" So he's like, "Oh, okay." So I was like, "Okay, he's gonna miss his chance." So I jumped in. I was like, "Hey." Give us five minutes. That's it. That's all, that's all we need, right? And then he's like, okay. So he shared the gospel. And within that five minutes, as he shared the gospel for the first time, the guy said, I want to accept Jesus Christ into my heart. And he accepted Jesus Christ. But you know who was most blessed? Pastor Dan. After he led that soul to Christ, when I looked at his face, he was about to cry. He didn't know what to do because he has never experienced this. Right? Why do I share this? Is because of this. All nations ministry, the reason why God has called us here together today to this remnant movement is so that we could do all nations ministry. So that we could save the people who are dying. So that we could give the answers to the Christians who are lost. There's so many Christians who love God, but what? They don't know the way. That's why you and I, we have to rise. That's why Christ's covenant church has to rise. Amen? Amen. We can't look at other people and just point fingers anymore. We can't say, you know, you do it. God wants us to do it. How do we start that? And that's what we're going to talk about towards the end. Okay? But throughout these times, now I was like for two years, like Pastor Sang Kim, as you know, the short guy. Right? Don't, don't tell him I said that. Right? He talks really fast, right? Um, and um, you know, he's really, he's like a brother to me. And he tried to call me, uh, you know, I would, but I, wouldn't, I didn't want to talk to him, so I didn't talk to him for two years. And then, you know, one time he called, so I picked up, and like, he almost cried, you know? He said, I missed you so much. But anyways, um, throughout that time, I had the opportunity to, you know, just come back again, surface. I wasn't missing in action anymore. That's like two and a half years ago. But... Now I realized and confirmed what the message that we're hearing through Pastor Yu is what the field needs now. Right? It's not just message. It's the answer to the field, to people who are dying. So through that, I started, <coughs> I did a church plant about two years ago uh, with Pastor Dan because the Korean pastor who asked me to help him said, you, you know, you need to go because you're doing remnant movement. <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I asked him, Pastor Dan, so what are you going to do? He's like, you know, I'm going to start this church with you. And uh, we only had like two members. We don't have that many members now too, right? Uh, but we're so happy because every opportunity we get, we go out and evangelize and try to find disciples. And we could, I'll share more answers about this as we go on. But 
Let's really think about this. If we understand this, the first thing that is restored in our heart is what? Thanksgiving. Are you thankful? If you're not thankful, you're living a religious life. Are you thankful even with all the crazy things that is going around in your life? Are you at peace? Amen? I felt that peace as I was worshiping here today. Are you thankful for Pastor Saul? I mean, he's kind of goofy looking. Don't tell him I said that. Right? And he can't speak English that well. But that man has heart. Right? We go out to college campuses. Right? He shares the gospel. Right? And uh, just, I'm thankful for him. Right? I mean, hearing this message that Jesus is the Christ every Sunday is blessing. So many churches, they talk about so many weird things. But here every Sunday, you know Pastor Song is going to preach about Christ. You know how amazing that is? I don't think we know. I think you need to go to like Kentucky or like, uh, I don't know, well, what's closest here, Nevada, you know, go to one of the churches and walk in, right? You will be surprised with all the things that pastors are proclaiming on, on the pulpit. We hear this truth that Jesus is the Christ. We should be thankful. You know, there's so many uh, professors who are in remnant movement, who are in Kentucky, Clarkson University, as we went about a month, two months ago. They're out nowhere. They're in the boondocks, right? There's nothing out there. Like if you go to like uh, Walmart, that's like their like mall. There's nothing out there. Right? But we go there and these professors, they're so hungry for the word of God. But they just go to regular, just normal churches because you know, they want to worship too. But they're saying, we hear so many weird things. You don't know how good you have. Hearing that Jesus is the Christ and world evangelism every Sunday. And training. How awesome is that? Right? Thankful for Pastor Song. And then are you thankful for your members? You know, after we finish and after LA conference, I go back to Virginia. But one day, Bible says, we're going to live together forever. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. You know? <laughs> but we're going to live together forever. Right? Just, I'm so thankful for all the members of uh, C4. Right? How about our wives, our children, kids? Right? It's not a coincidence. God had those meetings in mind with the blessing of all nations. You're one in 10 million. Thanksgiving. Why are we so thankful? Because why we know the truth that Jesus is the Christ. Solution to all of our problems. We know the true gospel. We have to say true gospel because why? People are confused when we talk about gospel. People have so many different definitions concerning the gospel. What is the definition of the gospel? Jesus is the Christ. We know true evangelism. Evangelism is not taking gospel tracts and talking to them. We have to do biblical evangelism. Okay? One professor actually I talked to in Ball State University in January, he was sharing his experience. What happened was uh, he's a Christian professor, and he really wants to share this gospel to people, his students. So he actually got a housing within the campus. And uh, he was basically saying, you know, he's a, a science teacher, so he started a course um, so that they will realize that through this course that the ultimate you know, reason for science is God. There's a higher being, okay? And uh, a few of the students entered into, uh, took this class, and they complained, saying, this professor is talking about God, religion. So the students sued the school. So the professor was saying, I can't do anything anymore in this school. I just teach what they want me to teach, but they are always you know, watching me, whether if I'm sharing this gospel or not. I don't know what to do. I think the best way is for me to go to another school, but God's not opening that door. So I don't know what to do. You know, people like this. I, I share the gospel to him. I give him the answer, what we have to do. We're not really connected, but I think he was really thinking hard. It's not just evangelism. It's biblical evangelism. We know the way. We know the a method to conquer this uh, region with the gospel of Christ. Another pastor I talked to, Northern Virginia Community College, he
he wants to share. The church that he was working for said, if you get 20 members from Northern Virginia Community College, we'll start a church for you. We'll cover your salary for like three years, right? So this young pastor, he's you know, ambitious, so he's like, you know what, 20 people, that's not that hard. So he went out to evangelize. And uh, what he came up with was flash drives, USB, right? Like 25 gigs, 26 gigs. During that time, it was really expensive. He would pass it out to the students. He'd be like, hey, how are you doing? Do you want a free USB? And they'll be like, yeah, sure, but what's the catch? And you know, he's like, there's no catch, it's free. And he'll give it to them, and he'll say, you know what? Gospel is free too, right? But they don't want the gospel. They only take the USB. He said, no one accepted Jesus Christ. Right? But when I was sharing uh, the answers that I was receiving, he was shocked. Do you know how precious evangelism is? Biblical method of evangelism. What we are learning right now, what we are training for right now. It's not just evangelism. It's the method to conquer this world. It's the method to do all nations ministry. The kingdom of God that was so far away from me. We thought kingdom of God is a place where we will go after we die. But after realizing that Jesus is the Christ, kingdom of God resides where? In my heart. Amen? In my heart. Kingdom of God is within us. Blessing of meeting, right? With all the people around us. So we try to do all nations ministry with our own standard. That's the problem. That has to be broken. We need to do all nations ministry with God's standard. That's why he has promised X18. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? So, we have to think about this. When we live our Christian life, we have to do what God's desire us to do. Right? What is God's desire? God's desire, Genesis 1.28. Subdue and conquer and rule this world. From the beginning, God's purpose is what all nations. When God called Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, for what reason? So he could be a blessing to all nations, for many nations. It's not just Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 2. If you look at the history of Old Testament, Israelites, why did God choose Israelites? Israelites thought God chose them because they're special. They are special, okay? But what they thought was they are the best group of people, right? And all the other people, they're below them. No, but God chose Israel so that they could be an instrument to shine forth the light of the gospel to all people. Why did God choose us? He chose us so that we could be a light to all nations, just like Israel. This is God's plan. It's not just evangelism. It's world evangelism. Look at Matthew 28, as we saw today, right? 16 through 20. Matthew 24, 14. When the gospel is proclaimed to the ends of the earth, that's when Christ will return. World evangelism, all nation ministry is not a special ministry. It's God's desire. God wants to start with whom? C4. Amen? He started it. Okay? And he's going to continue it. Right? Know the value of your church, how important your church is. That's what I want to actually you know, talk to you about. This church is so important. Right now, within the remnant movement, it's sad. We had a lot of people, young remnants, who joined, we joined this movement when we were young, but a lot of them have gone. A lot of churches right now, all the old pastors, first generation pastors, they're either passing away or they're retiring. Like within 10 years, we could maybe only have a handful of remnant churches in the United States. Not just remnants, but look at Los Angeles. I was so shocked. I'm thankful that I'm returning home Thursday. This area is just like, I'm not used to it. Like I heard gunshots, like, you know. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> I, I grew up in the projects. But I can't, I can't say that anymore. Okay? 
<laughs> Matthew 24, 14. <laughs> At this crucial, critical time, God has raised, raised C4. Amen? Amen? That's why we need to really pray for your pastor. We need to pray for our members, especially all nation members. I, I don't understand, like, it's so hard to be in this environment, but they're here. How amazing is that? Okay? Matthew 24, 14. This is God's desire. This has to be our absolute goal. Right? There's 237 nations here in the United States. Okay? We need to really proclaim this gospel to them. Right now, the time schedule here in the United States, as I experience, is time schedule of just gospel letter. You don't have to know that much. If you understand gospel letter, if you could really make this as your message, as you go, you would turn the world upside down. You would turn your field upside down. Because that's the time schedule right now. Okay. One person that I was talking to uh, in, um, about six months ago, we were having a, a night conference, uh, and uh, this guy just rolls in with a bicycle you know, clothes. You know, uh, so... He walked in and he's looking around and like I'm looking at him and uh, none of the people spoke English so I went up to him and I said, you know, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, isn't this where AA meeting is? You know what AA is, right? And uh, so I was like, no, this is actually church meeting right now. Um, and he's like, oh, great, you know. So, well, I asked him if you have time, I want to share uh, this message. And he's like, yeah, sure. So I sat him down and he's like 45 years old, good looking guy. And he came to AA meeting because he's struggling with alcohol. And he said to me, Pastor, I started drinking in high school, and I can't stop. He lost his family, lost his job, right? He's saying if he continues his path, he's done. That's why he joined AA meetings. And I was so shocked. You should look into this. Every county, they have AA meetings throughout the United States, 8 o'clock every day, 8 to 9. The particular county that we're meeting during that night, Loudoun County, they say there's 8,000 AA meetings going on. That's how many people are addicted to uh, alcohol. And you know what he said? When he goes into the meeting, uh, it's not just attending the meeting. You have to find winners. I'm like, what do you mean? Winners are the people who didn't drink for five, four years. So if you stick with them, you'll be okay. And uh, he was sharing all these things. So I was like, you know what? I hope this coincidence that God has sent you here. And I started sharing the gospel to him. I talked about Genesis 1.27 and talked about Genesis chapter 3, the spiritual problem. And he's like telling me, wait a minute, pastor, you're saying that gospel is that we need the gospel because of spiritual problem? And I was like, yeah. He's like, I've been to church before, but they don't talk about this. So if I stop any Christians right now on the road and say, can you tell me what spiritual problem is? Will people know? I said, no, not many people will know. He's like, this is amazing. And then he talked about Christ. And he's like, let's accept Jesus Christ as a personal savior. And he's like, of course. And he accepted Jesus Christ into his heart. That's the reality of the field that we're living in right now. There's so many people waiting for this gospel message. Right? How do we start? Matthew 24, 14, when this gospel will be proclaimed to the ends of the earth, with the vision and the direction of God's desire, all nations. Second, we have to realize the calling that he has given to us is not just any ordinary calling, but it's our greatest answer. Greatest answer for us is not being rich. It's not health. Right? Greatest answer for us is saving souls. Greatest answer for us is being pioneers for the movement of this remnant, all nations movement. God wants to give us this answer. <coughs> That's why from now on, you don't need to be shaken. Stand firm in Christ. Hold on to the covenant. Don't look at your surroundings and circumstances. We hear this all the time through Pastor Yu's message, right? Don't be fooled by devil's lies. Don't fall into deception. Hold on to the covenant and rise. Hold on to the covenant, right? And stand where you are. And God will use you and God will 
do the rest. That's what needs to take place, and that's what we need here today in our remnant movement. Not people who know message, all the messages, but we need remnants who are standing as a living witness. It's not just greatest answer, but it's also greatest what mission that God has given to us. Right? To save all nations. This is what we call the answer of recreation. The problem in the field today is unique problem. Okay? Just like Acts chapter 3. There was a cripple sitting in front of the temple, a beautiful gate, right? And this cripple, people thought helping him was carrying him to the temple so that he could beg for money and carrying him back when he's done to his house. People thought that's the solution. But Peter and John realized that's not the answer. He re they realized that there's a unique problem and the unique answer is only Christ. That's why he looked at the cripple and said, what? Silver and gold I have none, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. We could solve this problem. Especially like the United States right now, we see uh, a lot of racism, right? Racial wars taking place. The answer is what? Only Jesus. Only Christ. Right? Acts chapter 3. We have to give this answer. This is something that Trump cannot do, right? We have the answer in Jesus. And this is our true success. I shared this message throughout this past few days. You and I, we're already successful in Jesus. We're not seeking success. Okay? We're not pursuing success. We're successful in Jesus Christ because we have Christ. We have to teach our remnants this. Because right? you have Jesus, you're already successful. True success Okay? He's healing the problems that we see here today in this world. So, uh, as we take a break, I want you to think about our life. Where you are before God. Only God knows, right? You and God. And really pray, right? Holding on to the identity that God has given to you. Right? God says, you are His. He has purchased you with his blood. You're not alone. Emmanuel, God is with you. He's not just with you. He has solved all of your problems on the cross. And he is with you at this very moment. Right? Hold on to your identity. Okay? And what? Really stand before God so that you could receive new power every day. Actually, that's what we'll talk about more towards the end. How can we receive this new power? Okay? Uh, but... For me, after realizing this, I realized my true identity and the commission that God has given me. I realized, and my whole life makes sense, why God took my father away when I was young age, why I came to the United States, why I became a pastor, you know, why I had to go through what I went through. Right? It all makes sense. God has called you and I, okay, not as a coincidence, but he has called you and I so that God could use us to save all nations. I pray that you and I will be forerunners, okay? Pioneers of receiving this answer. Amen? Things have to change. It doesn't change when we point fingers. Things change when we change, when we stand before God. So uh, let's take a break at this time, but let's, let's pray for about a minute. Just holding on to uh, just uh, this short message that I shared with you. I just shared how important this All Nations ministry is. Okay. Let's really pray, Lord, help me to be a forerunner. Help me to receive this answer. Help our church so that we could receive this answer. Right. Let's pray together at this time. Father, we thank you and we give all the glory to you. For you, Lord, the Christ of the living God. Father, we ask that you will come guide us and lead us and look at a victory in you. I pray that you will come and strengthen us, Lord, day by day. In your name alone will be exalted. Help us, Lord Jesus, so that you will come. Lord Jesus, I am Father, I praise you, Lord, worship you. I ask you, Lord, that you will cut us and lead us, Lord Jesus, Lord. I am not just my Father, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for calling us. We thank you, Lord, for we are one in ten million. 
Father, we pray that you, God, will continuously work in us, uh, remove all the disbelief, help us to hold on to your promise and rise, Lord. Lord, may you start this All Nations movement through our lives, through this church. Father God, we give all the glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take a five-minute